You've guessed it. My presentation is all about bows. Don't worry, I don't want to sell them. My aim is to give you some familiarity with your bow by explaining the basic construction and some mechanical working of the bow parts. This is not a historical presentation uh, discussing different bow materials or different makes or the value of your bow. It is about sharing some very practical tips on everyday use and about basic preventative maintenance. So, who am I to speak on this topic? My name is Henrika Kovac. As a fellow string player and teacher, I had ample opportunity to learn by trial and error. For the better part of my life, I had rehaired mine and a number of your bows as well. I learned this trade from Dr. Mihai Barushka, who was at the time at the Wood Science Department of Forestry in Stellenbosch, but he was very sought after as an instrument restorer and bow rehearer. Sadly, he moved back to Switzerland. Look, I can take off the screw without the hair falling off. Now, let's go through some basic anatomy of the bow. And this is actually just for the brass players who accidentally clicked on this link. So, the tip is called the tip. The stick is called the stick. The hair is called the hair. And the screw is called the screw. And the frog is called the... Um, no, the frog is the only name of the bow part which is not really obvious, right? So this is going back in history to the Baroque and the Renaissance time because at the time the hair was fastened at the, in, into a stick at the tip and at the bottom and there was no frog and no screw. And in order to tighten the hair, you had to wedge a piece of wood in here at the bottom of the hair to get some tension. And in the most unsuspected moments, most probably during a concert, that little block would just jump out into the audience. Hence the name Frog. A hank of horse hair is selected and weighed off depending on the length and matching your bow. Some people like counting roughly 160 hair for a modern violin bow. But how would this account for different thicknesses of horse hair? The hank of hair is tied on both ends with a natural strong thread. Traditionally, it is then dipped into melted rosin and sealing wax. But these days, many bow makers use super glue of some sort. The hair is only fixed to the bow at two points. The one is the tip mortise and the other underneath the slide, the frog mortise. The wooden surfaces of the mortise and the wedge that goes in there are designed to form a friction fit. A properly cut wedge acts as a safety device. Should you over tighten your bow and or press too hard whilst playing, I would hope that the wedge would jump out rather than your bow breaking off at the tip. Like this one. Wedges should never be glued in. Gluing in wedges is most often an attempt to compensate poor workmanship. For rehairing, the glue needs to be removed mechanically and this can damage the mortise. So here's a challenge for you. Next time when you buy a budget bow, ask the salesperson to demonstrate to you that he can remove the wedges and that they're not glued in. There are some other patents using screws and plastic wedges to keep the hair in place uh, in the respective mortises but I will not elaborate on these here. Let's go a little bit into depth. So the screw has a button on the side so you can nicely turn it. The screw itself is made out of steel, sometimes stainless steel, which is meant to be much harder than the brass eyelet it goes into. 
Screws come with different threads, being metric and most of the time imperial. The French, though, have their own system, and even though they pioneered the metric system, they are using the imperial um, system with a so-called rolled thread, whereas the others are cut threads. The back end of the screw is square and sometimes tapered, like this one. And yes, you've guessed it, it would go into the round hole of the button. In case you live close to the coast and you have a bow maybe hanging on the wall that hasn't been played for quite some time, do go check on the screw whether it is um, still in a good, good shape. To lubricate a screw which sits very tightly in the eyelet, you can just use a very soft pencil like 4B or 6B pencil and with a graphite um, run a few times over the thread and you will have enough to turn the bow freely. However, if your problem is rust, you would definitely need something greasy and um, here is a very simple solution for you to just dip your screw into some petroleum jelly. The main cause for worn eyelets is turning the screw without supporting the frog. The correct way would be to press down the frog firmly onto the stick whilst turning the screw to release any tension there might be on the eyelet. Imagine tension away from the frog in the screw whilst turning the bow. Obviously, the friction will cause the soft brass to just wear away. Let me show you what you do when you are probably just before a concert in the green room and the eyelet strips and you cannot tighten your bow in any way. Try and look for a lady with a big bag and maybe ask whether she's got some dental floss in there. Otherwise, um, you might have to sacrifice one hair of your bow. I've got a black hair here. And just for the emergency, you might have to just try and pull, put that hair around a couple of times. Um, it will not, it, once you put the screw on, it will push it back and but little bits will break off and stay in there and it might just be what you need. There we go. So I'm putting this in and as you can see, it is not moving a, an inch or even a millimeter. <laughs> right. The other option would be if you're at home and you have some more time to just use some plumber's tape and run your plumber's tape round the and that is not a lasting solution but it's just for a quick fix and just while you still play a few more gigs and get a little bit more money this might just do the trick and save some parts there you go so those are your emergency fixes so let's have a closer look at the different parts that make up the frog. Um, so first I need to remove the ferrule, which is a metal half ring and uh, strengthens the, the front of the frog. Out comes the slide. It is a hardwood covered with pearl or mother of pearl abalone. And then at the bottom of the hole there, is the plug, the wooden plug, that is supposed to keep the hair in its place right down there. So in the modern bow we have three plugs or wedges, um, namely one at the tip, one at the frog and then the wedge that flattens the hair to spread it out underneath the ferrule. It is helpful information for you to know that should this wedge slip out your bow hair will not just fall out um, because it's only spreading the hair. Uh, obviously, it will not be as comfortable to play because the hair will scrunch up together in the middle um, instead of covering the width of your frog. Looking at the frog of a baroque bow by comparison, you would notice that there is neither a ferrule nor a wedge spreading the hair 
nor a slide and um, when I take off the screw there you can see that there is also no metal plate which is usually called the underslide. So let's now examine the delicate bow tip. In order to protect your bow there is a reinforcement in form of a plate. It can be anything from plastic to ivory to real mama's bone or metal. Um, it will have a lining most of the time, ebony or it can be fiber. These days normally an imitation ivory is put on to your bow tip. If you're a professional player and you have a bow tip with a very beautiful ivory on there, you would probably not be able to take this bow with you on a concert tour to some countries. You would have to check carefully because uh, if you cannot show where that ivory came from, then your bow might be confiscated. Other than the hollow of the bow tip with the slender sides, another weak spot is the top of the bow where the bow stops and the tip starts because the grain is running in the same direction as the tension on your bow when you tighten your hair. One thing that you would never like to do is to hit with your bow stick on anything, not even your stand when applauding for a soloist coming onto the stage, because you just might run the risk of breaking the bow tip off completely. If you have a cheap or a very sturdy carbon fiber or in synthetic material bow and you chip the tip of your bow like the middle one here, it would not really be necessary to replace the whole tip. So after suggesting not to hit your stand with your bow ever, let's talk about where to look and how to understand the signs that you can find on your bow stick, showing you more about your style of bowing. If you see that the wood and the varnish is worn exactly where you place your most beautiful spiccato, then be sure that you are actually playing more with the wood than actually with the hair of your bow. Um, you might just go back to the mirror and examine exactly how you produce sound with your bow and maybe um, you will get a stronger result or a different result by just re-examining exactly the angle with which you put your bow to your string. Bow style is a very personal topic though and I wouldn't like to mess with anybody's style um, but if you also lose a lot of hair um, it is because you catch your hair between the hard winding of the string and the wood of your bow, both hard surfaces and the hair in between just gets rubbed away. Another place to keep a careful watch on is between the leather grip and the frog where your thumbnail actually cuts into the wood making it a weak spot. Once again you might just consider whether the curve of your thumb is exactly the way that you would find it best. Experiment a little bit, maybe you are onto something, maybe you find a way that is much more relaxed and doesn't hurt your thumb as much. Some people prefer to add an extra layer over the leather grip either for comfort or for extra protection. This is um, something bought at a sports shop to cover cricket bats and will stick on there or sometimes you might find if your special pen doesn't write anymore you can actually remove that pen, pen grip on there. Now for some myth busting. Is there truth to the more hair you put in your bow, the more sound I get? No. Depending on your bow frame and your instrument, of course, a heavy bow with too thick hair might mute the sound and cause your instrument to sound dull. A frail old bow with a slender tip should get a light hank and a robust heavy bow or a carbon fiber bow would need a heavier hank. Baroque bows use much less hair than their modern counterparts. 
Is there truth to thick hair, most commonly black or gray hair, would give you more sound? No. Since your bow width is set within the ferrule and the hair is round, the amount of contact points um, on the string will increase when using the thinnest available hair. This happens to be Mongolian hair and hair which originates from cold climates such as Mongolia where horses maybe had limited food supply seem to be the strongest. Depending on the origin and kind of horse, the quality of the hair varies. Important aspects for string players are the elasticity, surface texture and length of the hair. Full-size violin bows need the longest hair and bass bows the shortest. So looking from the frog to the point, the difference between violin, cello and double bass. Being a natural product, there are many impurities in hair that need to be removed. And that is the selection process. And in fact, there are a couple of selection processes. And in the end, you will end up with three kilogram of hair from an initial bunch of 10 kilogram. Here now are some general tips on caring for your bow. Always loosen the hair before you pack away your bow. Not too much, otherwise the hair might catch on to something, but there should be absolutely no tension on the wood. Never leave your bow lying in the direct sunshine or in direct heat like in a car, especially not if there's tension on the bow. Um, remember that the bow itself is carved from a straight piece of wood and bent with heat. So leaving it in a hot environment will reverse the process of bending the bow. Always protect your bow when you travel. Either put it in your instrument case or a bow case if you don't have any. Just take a simple PVC tube and uh, some sponge on the sides that will do the trick. In case one or more hair got caught somewhere and stretched, don't cut them off. Um, rather shrink them back with heat. I'll show you how. I have a glass spirit lamp but you can also use a fire lighter. A normal candle will not work since it will leave black soot on the hair. While holding the bow firmly at the tip and the frog, I would run at a constant pace right through the middle of the flame and you might just have seen how that loose hair just jumped back into place. After having done that for the couple of times, I would turn the bow around and start from the heel and go to the tip, always taking the hair right through the middle of the flame. Be careful not to ever use too much rosin on your bow. Never over tighten your bow because it will snap at the point. Always be on the lookout in your instrument case for this nasty enemy number one. It is a larva of a beetle family, also called the carpet beetle, and it loves eating natural fibers and bow hair is their absolute number one favorite meal. The first remedy would be to vacuum your case very thoroughly in all the crooks and niches and then to put it out into bright light but maybe not direct sunlight. I would try to go with a natural pest repellent like lavender leaves or maybe a drop of tea tree oil or cedar oil which is also known in this regard. Try to avoid using mothballs since the chemical in there is a neurotoxin. Should you break a hair of your bow, rather cut or bite it off than pull it out. Because if you pull it out of the thread which is underneath in the mortise, um, the, the thread might become too loose and then suddenly all the hair might just pull out underneath the plug or wedge. Imagine your bow needs a desperate rehair, but... Your golden gig has not yet arrived and there simply is no money for a rehair unless you play a gig. Which of course you can't do since the hair is used up. Now, there are a couple of tips to help you play that gig to get back onto your feet. Firstly, you are going to heat up the hair to let the cuticle around the hair just so to speak ruffle their feathers. 
Before you do that though, you need to clean the excess rosin of your bow. To do that, you would need to play with a very flat bow, very close to the bridge um, on your lowest string as loud as you can. Your cat should jump off the couch and look very worried. Tighten the hair a little bit until they are all straight and have some tension and then watch my instructions somewhere in this video how to heat up the hair without scorching them. If this doesn't help though, and only if you still have plenty of hair on your bow, cut away a very thin layer of hair at the bottom side which touches the string. The fresh hair should then still have perfect grip. Should you have too little hair on your bow, um, your last resort would be to clean the hair. I would stay away from strong chemicals and actually wash the hair. Remove the screw and cover the frog and the wooden tip with cling wrap because they should definitely stay completely dry. Use a very mild detergent or shampoo and gently wash the hair. Rinse it very well and then let it dry lying flat with absolutely no tension on the hair. Also watch out that you never ever let the frock fall through the hair since this would tangle up your hair, your hank of hair completely. Right, now go play your gig and start getting rich. I would feel that I've accomplished something today if after this presentation, you will not shy away from taking your bow, unscrewing the frog to inspect the inside. Oops, only to do it all over once more, realizing that you had forgotten to press down the frog onto the stick whilst unscrewing. Sincere thanks to Dr. Marie Mayen for giving me this opportunity to present.